I want to invite you to uh, pray with me. Father in heaven, in this time we thank you that you still hold the world in your hands. There's lots of things going on in the world, lots of things going on in our minds that distract us and confuse us perhaps even, uh, but we are here because we want to get away from all the distractions of the world. We want to worship you. We want to give you our heart and our attention, and we want to hear from you, Lord. So speak to us in this difficult time in our world, and let us know what you have to say to us through your word, and may your word be truth. Lord, bless me in preaching and all of us in listening by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I invite you to open your Bibles at home there and keep them open throughout the sermon, if you don't mind. And we'll look at Judges chapter 6. And we'll read the first 24 verses. This is the word of the Lord. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak of Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizarite where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a winepress to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But Sir Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring up us people from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us in the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have, and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord Gideon asked, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down the Midianites together. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, Give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went in, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour he had made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in the basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on a rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. With the tip of the staff that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it stands in Ophrah of the Azabizrites. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Well, friends in Christ, 
We are all somewhat anxious, of course, in this day and age, if not terrified by the corona, COVID-19 virus plaguing the world. We are worshiping completely separately because we have to do this for our safety. And this is not part of fear, this is part of wisdom following the instruction of medical professionals. But all around us is fear. People hoarding toilet paper, of all things, so that they don't think they'll get some for the next 10 years, it seems. One couple I read about uh, took all the meat from the grocery store, leaving nothing for anyone else. We've all seen this kind of panic buying or heard about irrational behaviors that people have in today's world. The list of craziness grows longer by the day as people live in fear of COVID. We are in a very different spring season, something none of us have experienced before. We hear sounds like, or words like global pandemic, social distancing, and self-isolation or quarantine that are mostly foreign to us. And some people might even think hand-washing is a foreign thing, but I hope not. All of this stuff can scare the spit out of us, but we aren't supposed to spit either because that would spread germs. So you need a little laugh. I'm sorry, I need to at least in all this craziness. But seriously, life can feel pretty messy at times. In response, let's ask ourselves from our text this morning, first of all, where is God in this mess? There's a line from a movie called Let There Be Blood that comes to my mind. It's not a funny movie at all. It's a pretty dark show, in fact. But at one point, this is probably why I like it, a crazy preacher uh, forces a semi-repentant oil man played by Daniel Day-Lewis to say, I've abandoned my child. I've abandoned my boy. And after a half-hearted repetition, the preacher isn't happy with that level of contrition in that oil man. And so he says, say it louder, louder, Daniel. And then Daniel finally shouts at the top of his voice in the little church building, I've abandoned my boy. And anyway, as I read this story of Gideon in Judges 6, you get the sense that Gideon would like God to say the same words, to repent of abandoning his boy, his child, Israel. Trouble comes, and people are quick to wonder where God is. Even when they don't normally confess faith in God, they suddenly feel like it's God's job to protect us, to fix all of our problems. Do you ever feel that way? The truth is that God desires for Israel, in their time of craziness, to see that he is present with them. Out of love for them, sometimes the messinesses in life that God brings are his wake-up call to us to know him better, to truly know him for who he is. Now, as our world currently lives in fear of a microbe we can't see, our text reminds us of a time when Israel feared the Midianites, who they could see. And verse 6 says in a word, the Midianites impoverished Israel. The passage speaks about the season of war back then. Each year in the spring, the Midianites and other allies came into Israel territory. They were strong. They were powerful. They were uncountable. They looked like a swarm of locusts, like a plague of grasshoppers. They covered the ground with their tents and their cattle, destroying all the freshly budding plants and crops that the Israelites had put down. They frightened Israel so much that they fled anywhere to get out of the sight of the Midianites. They hid in the mountains, they hid in caves, any place where they'd be less likely to be noticed. So it is that we find Gideon threshing wheat in a wine press. Now that ought to strike you as strange. Why would you thresh wheat in a wine press? Normally, you thresh wheat on a hill outside of the town somewhere where there's the best breeze because you beat the grain, you throw it in the air, the chaff blows away, and then the grain drops to the ground. But when the Midianites come to town, people go into social isolation. The wine press was underground. It was a series of rooms, and we don't have to get into the mechanics of it, but just get the picture that Gideon is doing 
an outside job in an underground cave because he's deathly afraid of the Midianites finding him and stealing his food. The Midianites had done this for seven years, according to our text. So for seven years, there was next to no harvest that would have been received by Israel, and that had to be of taking its toll. Now the angel of the Lord now comes to Gideon in his hideaway with reminders of God's work in the past for Israel. And here's the response to this divine messenger. Look at verse 13 in your Bible. But Sir Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? Now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hands of Midian. The Lord has abandoned us. That's faithless Gideon's response. It's God's fault. He's supposed to keep our lives trouble-free. We've been abandoned. We can easily fall into that way of thinking when things get rough, can't we? Should God keep me from all harm? Isn't that what Psalm 121 even says? Why did this COVID virus come to us? Why do we have to hide in our houses like this? Why do people have to get sick? Why do some people have to die? Why doesn't God step in? The assumption in these questions, and in Gideon's question as well, is that God must be against us if things are going badly. As Gideon put it, if the Lord is with us, why did this happen to us? In other words, it's God's job to stop bad things for us. So we must, he must not be with us. But the second thing this passage teaches us is that God is with us. When our daughter Rachel almost died two years ago and then was recovering, I needed to ground myself afresh in the realities of my relationship with God in Jesus. The song we'll sing after the sermon became one of my pieces of daily bread on that journey. I listened to it almost every day, if not more than once a day. It had encouragement that I needed because it was Bible-based for one thing, and it fed me along with reading the Bible. It kept me focused on knowing that God is with us in the storms and the challenges of life. From their fearful circumstances, verse 6 tells us the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. And verses 7 and 8 say, When the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And it goes on from there to give a little bit more detail of that time of Exodus. Now, the interesting thing about this story off the top is that Israel is just crying out for help. It's not even a cry of repentance because they were so astray from God, but it's just a cry for help. It's a lot like people today, even us. We don't pray until something bad happens. Our child is sick, and suddenly it's, Oh, God, help! COVID comes, and we cry out. Our jobs are threatened. Our economy is crushed as if the Midianites are trampling on it like they did in the land of Israel. Too often our reaction is to doubt God's presence or concern. So we cry out in fear for God to fix it. Fix things, God. While God's messenger reminds Israel of God's covenant, his promises to be faithful to them, along with reminding Israel of God's promise, he recalls God's actions in the past to fulfill his promises. He thinks specifically of God's action through Moses and bringing Israel out of Egypt. The messenger's point is that God is always present. He's faithful to his covenant promises even when we don't see him and we don't understand his ways. But it is in his time and in his way that God acts on behalf of his fearful people. He provided a deliverer, Moses, to the Israelites, slaves in Egypt in his time and in his way. God always has the long picture in mind. When he 
when we only see the, the short, we only see the, the immediate needs and feelings that we have. Remember, Israel was in Egypt 400 years. God never had them out of his sight. He was never away from them. He always had a plan for deliverance, and it moved at his perfect pace. Despite the anxiety of Israel, God was there, and he was a steady and faithful God. The world is in his hands, then and now. During the time of the judges, when Israel is being pummeled over and over by her enemies that she failed to banish from Canaan, the Lord gives his covenant children reminders of his presence, reminding them, I was with Israel in the time of Egypt and the Exodus. I'm still here. One of God's actions today in, in the case of Gideon's life is sending Gideon to Israel. Now, as much as Gideon did some pretty amazing things in the upcoming chapters, we notice that he's reluctant and weak. As we already noted, Gideon was hiding in a wine press. He was a bit of a chicken. As the chapter continues, we also see that he tries to get around God's call to him. He describes himself as coming from the smallest and the weakest tribe and clan, which isn't really true. You see, his father was wealthy. Gideon was nobility of sorts in that part of the country. But he downplays his place when God calls him to service. He reminds us a bit of Moses, doesn't he? With Moses' hesitancy to serve the Lord, when God said, you need to be my mouthpiece and go to Pharaoh, Moses was a chicken too. Nonetheless, God uses these weak vessels, this cracked clay pot, to continue his work. God uses us in our brokenness, and he uses Gideon in his brokenness to remind the people of his love and faithfulness. These are reminders of God's presence in the past to encourage his people in the present. And so after giving that little history lesson to Israel, God calls Gideon to rescue Israel, and he gives Gideon this assurance in verse 16. The Lord answered Gideon, I will be with you, and you will strike down the Midianites together. I'm with my people, says God. You have nothing to fear. Today, the presence of God to us is not only in his covenant promises, but in the fulfillment of those promises through God's action in sending Jesus to us. Gideon was an unwilling servant of God who managed, with God's help, to deliver Israel from oppression from the Midianites for a time. But Jesus, friends, Jesus becomes our willing Emmanuel. He comes to us, God with us. He takes on the enemies and he wins. He heals those living in fear. He touches those who are forced into social isolation like lepers and he heals their bodies so they can connect with people again. He delivers those in mental isolation, demon-possessed people living in hills, afraid of themselves and feared by everyone who sees them. He heals the unclean woman who touches him and removes the plague of social distancing that has touched her for and held her in bondage for 12 years. He touches the eyes of the blind so they can see the world and enjoy life anew. He touches dead bodies and raises them to life, restoring them to those who lost them. Jesus acted out of love to those living in fear in this messy world of ours. Ultimately, the Lord Jesus takes on sin and defeats Satan and hell so that we can be assured of God's presence in our daily lives and for all eternity. You see, it's in this life already that Jesus wants us to have that assurance so that we can live in peace, not fear. That's the third thing to see in our reading today. Gideon was fearful of a lot of things, even of the Lord. After the angel of the Lord showed God's approval of the offering Gideon made, Gideon was afraid he'd die because he was in the presence of God. A lot of people had that in the Bible. Well, listen to what starts at verse 22. When Gideon realized it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. That kind of reminds us of Moses, too, at the burning bush, who also feared for his life after encountering God. And you read the same sort of words 
from Samson's father in Judges 13. But here in chapter 6, we read in verse 23, But the Lord said to him, Peace. Do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. You see, the knowledge of the presence of the Lord gave peace to Gideon in the face of Midianite attacks. You and I are assured by Jesus in the fears of our lives that peace is his gift to us. One passage that comes to mind is where the disciples are all fearful because Jesus is talking about leaving them. And they are confused and upset. And Jesus says to them in John chapter 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. I don't take it back. I give. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Fear in uncertainty grips the heart of the disciples just as it can grip our hearts today. We have no idea how long this pandemic will last. We have no idea, no certainty of how many lives it will touch or to what degree it will touch us. The Apostle Paul went through a lot of trials and he learned to rest in the peace of Christ during the uncertainties and messiness of his life. And we know the words that he wrote, the well-known words that he gave to the church in Philippi in Philippians 4, verses 4 to follow. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. That's the presence of the Lord. Therefore, he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Cry out to God. Present your request to him. And what's the result? The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. The peace of God is ours through Jesus Christ, no matter whether the threat is Midian or COVID. We look back at Jesus and remember, he is our victor over every force of evil, illness, death, sin, and Satan. Like Gideon and Israel were told to look back at the deliverance of God in Egypt to remember the faithfulness of the Lord, so we today look at Jesus and his victory on the cross, what he did for us. Remember how he is victorious over leprosy, over blindness, over bleeding, and even death. Remember, he won the victory for us over sin on the cross. He's got us and the whole world in his loving, saving, faithful hands. Now before we end, remember finally that Jesus also wants us to share the peace he gives us. He calls us to be agents of his peace all of the time. And no time is more important than when fear surrounds our community. After God assures Gideon of his presence, Gideon gets peace from God. We read in verses 24, So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Ophrah of the Abizarites. Now the words to this day it stands are strange to us, but they are an invitation to come and see. The writer of Judges is saying to the people of his day, the altar Gideon built to commemorate God's gift of peace is still standing in Ophrah. Go and look. Go and see it for yourself if you don't believe me. He's saying the altar of Gideon is Gideon's testimony. People would look and they would say, what's that there for? And in a similar way, we can lean into Jesus during these uncertain days of COVID-19 and live out of the peace that Jesus fills our hearts with. And our lives will bear witness that the Lord is our peace. When Rachel was so sick, we didn't know if she'd live. And when we didn't know what the quality of life would be after she started to get better, we we were still concerned and worried. But many of you lived through that trial with us as you followed our story on Facebook. And here we are now, socially connecting through the internet. 
we were back then socially isolated from all of you being 10,000 miles or whatever away in a land where we could scarcely understand the people and, and their language. And yet the peace of Christ that passes all understanding was ours. And I don't say it was our peace that came from within ourselves. It was his peace that came to us. People said to us so often, you're handling this situation so well. Your lives are such a testimony. And all we could say was, thanks be to God. The Lord Jesus gave us his peace. It wasn't our peace. It was our peace after he gave it to us. And we were strengthened, we were comforted, and we had the assurance that he was with us in the storm. So you see, people, it's not us. It's Jesus. It's him. Cry out to him in these times of uncertainty and fear. Draw near to him and be assured that his peace will fill you and make your life a testimony to people who are living in fear all around us today. Don't be afraid. The Lord is with us, and the Lord is our peace. Say amen.